Wi-Fi matters. So this episode is dedicated to my dad as today is Father's Day. My dad loves to cook and he is the best chef that I know. And trust me, I've eaten at a lot of pretty cool places. He's such a big foodie and I think he's going to particularly love today's episode because I'm going to be interviewing Logan Guleff. Logan is the winner of the second season of MasterChef Junior. He's a teen entrepreneur, a celebrity chef, and he was named in Time Magazine's 2016 30 Most Influential Teens in the World, among many other things. I hope you enjoyed the interview. Hi, Logan. Thank you so much for being on Wi-Fi Matters. Super excited to have you here, and I can't wait to learn more about your life as a chef and an entrepreneur. Oh, thank you so much for having me today. So when did you start cooking? Well, it, it all really started when I was two years old. And um, I was cooking morning coffee. And that's that's really where I found my passion was with coffee. And I was, I was kind of a little bit of a barista. And I, I really enjoyed it. And then from there, I kind of advanced farther. And I got to like pigs in a blanket, mm-hmm. pasta. E- still easy, but more challenging. More room for um, artistry in it. Okay. And... Um, then, you know, I entered my first contest when I was eight. Mm-hmm. And that was kind of a breakout moment for me because um, I took like following a recipe and then I turned that into creating a recipe. So, you know, I think with that kind of snowball effect of just like, you know, I love cooking, I was enjoying it. And then I kind of like got really, really good at it. And then it was like, well, oh, where, where'd it go from here? And, and I went into creation and and having fun and just just messing around in the kitchen, coming up with crazy ideas, cooking them up, and then entering contests. Because mm-hmm. well, the thing about a contest is it really focuses your attention in. Like, it allows you to go from, like, all of your creativity, which is bouncing off the walls. It's everywhere, right? Mm-hmm. All the way down into one thing. That's and that's, that's kind of really important when you're when you're really creative at the start when you're like oh i got so many ideas so many things i want to do what what works what doesn't work mm-hmm. you have to stay in the box yeah you have to use this ingredient mm, that's and, like, and so how what's happening in your mind like when you create your 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 recipes like what's your source of inspiration well, it really depends on the recipe okay. you know it's just like any kind of artwork or, or music composition you have to think like mm-hmm what what is this what what where where am i using it how am i going to be using it what's it for who's going to eat it kind of deal like i mean you think about why like beethoven wrote like for elise what was for elise (laughs) it was it was for her so in that sense cooking is very much the same way you could take inspiration from who you're cooking for your -hmm. ingredients and the freshness Mm -hmm. like um i have this peach fennel soup that I made. It's really delicious. Yeah. And I really focus on the ingredients for the inspiration in the in the springtime and the summer mm-hmm. and those kind of feelings to get like this cold soup that tastes really delicious. Interesting. The, yeah. the fresh peaches and the fresh fennel. And then just taking those two really nice ingredients and going, all right, here we go into a nice cold summer soup. Um oh, that's amazing. And so do you do you have like any pet peeves when you cook? Um, you know, I would say that one of the pet peeves is that's, that's kind of, kind of a double-edged sword for me mm-hmm. is, you, you know, whenever you get an unexpected reaction or an unexpected flavor, mm-hmm. like it's what I live for and yeah. it's what I want. Like, I want that to happen, okay. but it's also a pet peeve because it just messes up your entire plan. Like, Interesting. Yeah. like you have like... They're going seems, one way and then it takes you the other, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, it does. And that's kind of hard as a chef to get over, mm-hmm. like having your plan not work, mm-hmm. like having your flavors do something different and get a mind of their own. Yeah. So, so you've won so many cooking competitions. And I, I mean, what's your competitive edge? Like, how do you differentiate yourself from all this competition? You know, I think it always comes down to my creativity. And, and risk taking. Whenever you're in a competition, you have to think, where, what's the risk that I could take that's going to get me farther? Like, what's, what's the thing that I can do that the guy next to me won't do? Mm-hmm. And then do it and succeed. And like, if what, in cooking, 
that's like, what's, what's the flavor profile that's very unexpected that I can get to work brilliantly? Mm -hmm. All right, that'll work. Or, you know, sometimes it's just something as simple as like, you know, you, you feel it and you know when, you're, when it's done. Mm -hmm. And that kind of innate feeling of like, I know the steak's going to be done now. Mm -hmm. And it is. That's kind of another edge. Mm. But I, I would always say it's, it's my creativity cool. and the risk taking. When you're a chef, you got you to gotta be willing to open yourself up to letting things burn, mm. which is really tough because as a chef, you don't want anything to burn. Exactly. But you have to have enough elements or have enough things that it has a chance mm. because the chef next to you probably won't do it and you know understanding where your strength lies like um once again i was always small so mm -hmm. understanding that i'm i'm not gonna be i'm not gonna have the same knife cuts as someone who's larger mm -hmm. taller someone who's like Ugh! yeah and uh, or like i am now 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 mm -hmm. i can do those knife cuts and i can break mm -hmm. things down like that but mm -hmm. before it was a lot more challenging and, and mm -hmm. i do a lot worse jobs so I yeah. think always play to your strengths and never, never, never try to like, like play to your strengths, not compensate for your weaknesses. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, so I really enjoyed your TEDx talk on the art of flavor. So what does it mean to you to be a flavorist? For me, it's, it's always, it's always putting together the most interesting flavors. Like, um, I'm thinking of flavor in a way that puts it first. I always put flavor first. Mm -hmm. I do flavor, then texture, and then like whatever else. It mm -hmm. doesn't really matter after that. Yeah. Like appearance, <laughs> who cares? Let, let those let those pastry chefs with their tweezers do what they do. Yeah. It's not it's not who I am. It's not what I do. To me, I think it's it's thinking of flavor in a different way and, and really prioritizing it and being like, you know, if I have this flavor, let's say I have fish. Mm -hmm. then what are where can i go from there you can go you can go a mediterranean route you can bring in like um nutmeg paprika mm -hmm. um turmeric those mm -hmm. kind of things and you can kind of go with like a kind of spicy mediterranean fish or you can bring it with tomatoes and, and fresh pasta and a mm -hmm. little bit of basil and you can do like a really fresh italian dish yeah. or you can think, well, I could do like a chimichurri sauce, which mm -hmm. is kind of a tough sauce, and I wouldn't normally do it with fish, but mm -hmm. what can I do to balance that out? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I think that it's always thinking about your options with flavor. Mm -hmm. Like, where can you go? What can you do? Mm -hmm. What can you add? And what's worth adding? Mm -hmm. Like, just because, just because it's there doesn't mean you have to add it. And I think that the best example is if you watch a lot of culinary competition TV shows. Yeah. You, you always <laughs> see, like, not 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 gonna say anything, but Chopped is notorious for this. <laughs> the people they always grab the truffle oil at the last minute. Like last minute they, they run to the pantry, they're like, Oh my god, I forgot something. I'm gonna get the truffle oil. And they come and they and they just pour this truffle oil all over the dish and the judges tear into them about it and they get chopped. And I've seen it like like five or six times. <laughs> it's like every time they grab the, the truffle oil, it's always I call it the kiss of death. Okay. Because I mean you're eliminated once you use it kind of deal it's kind of funny yeah. but if you really if you really look it's there so i think that that's a perfect illustration of like is it worth adding does it add something to my dish mm -hmm. it, and does it fit with the rest of the theme mm -hmm. like so it's sort of like how like you were saying in your ted talk like how an artist like you can't overdo a painting and you want everything in the painting to sort of be in harmony i guess yeah, definitely. You want all your flavor profiles to be working together to create one experience. Okay. And just like an artist, like if you think about, all right, I'm gonna pull pull up another another example here. Think about Starry Nights. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, could you imagine if um, Vincent Van Gogh added the color red to Starry Nights? No. Doesn't no. Work. It just doesn't work. It's, it's, yeah. So yeah, like with that. cooking yeah. is the exact same way. If you add like a hot pepper for say, mm. or you add like some kind of thing that just totally breaks it, like 
Yeah. You have like a bechamel and a gastrique sauce. There's no way. One is a is a cream sauce, and the other is like this tangy, sour, sweet sauce, and they just don't go together. And okay. and you shouldn't put them on the same painting, just like mm. you wouldn't put red on Starry Nights. Yeah. Um. So you've met like a lot of celebrities. So who is the coolest celebrity you've met? Mm, that's a tough one. Um, do you know there? There's one celebrity that I I, I cooked dinner for, um, mm-hmm. at a private dinner, in in LA, and it was it was fabulous. But I I signed the paper and said like yeah, I can't yeah. talk about them, but okay. they're they're the coolest. Okay. Um, they're they're a big, big name in the entertainment in this industry. Mm-hmm. Um, that's about all I can say. Otherwise, you know, meeting President Obama was yeah. uh, what was crazy. that experience like? Well, for me, I was like, I was nine. I think I was nine or 10 at the time. Mm-hmm. And um, I had some classmates, right? Who I'm mm-hmm. homeschooled. So they were kind of friends of mine. And they were going to go do a trip to DC soon. And I entered the contest and I was like, oh yeah, I'm going to DC. And they're like, oh yeah, we're so psyched. We're going <laughs> to tour the White House. And I was like, <laughs> huh. Yeah, I've got, I've got, yeah, I've got, I'm going to do the same thing. And, and of course, uh, I won the first ever Kids State dinner, so I got to represent Tennessee uh, and eat in the White House and meet the president and the first lady and, and go through a bunch of rooms. And there's all the Secret Service and the snipers on the rooftops. And you're like, oh, my God, where am I? What am I doing? This is insane. And <laughs> for me, that's one of the experiences that always stands out. It's like everyone always loves a chef. Mm. And cooking can take you a lot of amazing places. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, and like in 2014, you won season two of Master Chef Junior, which is amazing. So congrats! Um, just tell us about this experience. Well, it was a it was a very tough experience. It was very challenging. Mm-hmm. There was a lot to it. There was a lot, a lot to it because mm-hmm. you have your challenges, and and you have like your cooks who are stronger than you, and the cooks that are that are weaker than you. Mm-hmm. And you're always gauging the competition. You're always thinking, well, who, am I, who do I got to watch out for? Who's the front runner? Mm-hmm. And then, like, if you remember in the, in the beginning, there was, um, there was this girl named Natalie. And mm-hmm. she won the first, the first challenge. Mm-hmm. And we were, we were all scared. We were all like, oh, man, Natalie's so strong. Mm-hmm. And then she gets, like, eliminated two episodes later. Mm-hmm. And we're like, oh, man, who's the strongest now? And so we're constantly sizing each other up as, like, so you're going through a lot of thoughts in your mind constantly mm-hmm. and you only get one shot per dish yeah. and that time when it's over it's over good point yeah so it's really challenging because if you burn something that takes 30 minutes to cook it yeah what are you gonna do you, so you have, yeah it's quite the what if game mm. especially when things don't go your way and it's the really unnerving people. when the judges come up to you and, and you're cooking, right? So yeah. you're, you're oh, cooking yeah. and you're cooking and they come up and they talk to you yeah. and Wait, I've, always, you keep... yeah, I've always watched those on TV and like, like, how do you focus when they're talking to you? Like, well, what you try to do is you try to make sure that what you're doing in the kitchen isn't more important. Mm-hmm. And like, so you, so you're cooking something and you're, unless you're cooking something important, like mm-hmm. sometimes they'll roll up and they'll just come up to you while you're cooking your protein and you're like, this is not what I need. I don't, I don't need this now. I'm trying to get a perfect cook on this steak or a perfect cook on this shrimp. And these guys are coming up trying to talk to me and I'm having a hard time gauging if this is done yet. And if it's overcooked, I'm going to get yelled at. If it's undercooked, I might be eliminated, but they might not even eat it. If it's undercooked, they'll say, ah, you know, this is too raw. We can't eat it. Yeah. And then, you know, you might have, they might taste something and then, They'll make a face and you're like, is that a good face or a bad face? Do I need to change it? What do I need to add? Is it too salty? And so you can work yourself up into this, this anxiety, just yeah. filled nightmare because they've come up to you and they, and one of them might've just like gone from like smiling to like, kind of like not smiling. And you've been like, oh no, am I going home? Is, is this, is this the end? I'm packing my bags. It's over. <laughs> yeah. So that's always it, it's so challenging because mm-hmm. you're just cooking and you only got one shot per mm-hmm. per thing. I mean, it's amazing every like 
you you won, which is amazing. And so you got a hundred thousand dollars in prize money. Um, and for someone that young, I mean, it must have been just. I just I guess it's just crazy. So what did you do with the money? Well, I put it in the bank. Okay. And yeah. you know, I I, I was just. Uh, I didn't do anything stupid with it because, mm-hmm. you know, you always hear about, like, NFL star buys a tiger, gets broke, has mm-hmm. $2 to their name, and then, mm-hmm. like, is trying to get this next big deal. Yeah. And, you know, my, my parents were like, you know, that's not going to happen. And mm-hmm. I didn't really have anything I really wanted to buy. I just put it in the bank and, mm-hmm. and let it grow and try yeah. to invest some of it. And, you okay. know, try to be as smart as possible because mm-hmm. you you can take something like that where – like it's it's pretty substantial and then you can yeah. grow it into something more and, and mm-hmm. like nurture it properly Definitely. and then it'll give you a lot more options later down when you want the money like yeah that's a good point yeah um so gordon ramsay so he was a judging um you for master chef right um yeah. to most people he's a very tough person um so how did you feel being around him and i guess what was the best advice that he gave you all right well Gordon's very intense. Yeah. He's like, he's like an energy in the room. Like mm-hmm. you, you can tell. Mm-hmm. And because he's like the big star, yeah. You, when he walks in, there's just the air in the room changes and it mm-hmm. starts crackling and stuff. And you know, whenever he was the most intimidating of mm-hmm. all the judges, because you knew that he could pop off yeah. at any moment <laughs> about anything, and that you'd be in the wrong. Yeah. And it didn't. It didn't matter because in the end, you would know that he was right. And you would know like, well, you didn't cook this right. Mm -hmm. And, and you would deep down know that you didn't cook it right. Mm -hmm. And he would tell you that, you know, you really grow to like him Mm -hmm. through the the show as, as Mm -hmm. you go through each challenge and as he, Mm -hmm. as he presents you with each new thing and and each new thing to prove that you're, you're the best chef. Mm -hmm. And I would say the best advice he ever gave me was like, it was during the pop-up restaurant and I, and I had messed up the ceviche. Mm-hmm. I messed up the ceviche like 12 times and I got yelled about it mm-hmm. easily 30 times about this ceviche. Every, every time I put a plate of ceviche up to the window, it came right back with a complaint. It was either too salty, too spicy, too peppery, too acidic. But then um, he, he took me aside and he says, you know, like, Logan, like, bud, well, what's going on? And uh, uh, Why did you come to this competition? And I was like, uh, I came to this competition to get better chef. And he was like, yeah, just remember that if it isn't your best, you shouldn't be putting it out and you shouldn't be serving it. Interesting. And, and that always resonates with me. Wow. It's just so powerful because it's so much like, you know, if this isn't your best, it shouldn't, it shouldn't even come before my eyes. Like, yeah. I, I shouldn't even see it. Like, don't, it, don't serve it. Don't send it. Throw you, it in the trash. You take get rid of it. Advice and like, um, every aspect of your life because it relates to everything you know like don't do stuff half-heartedly you know yeah i try i try to bring it into a lot of my other life and um so you won the james beard best blended burger oh, and boy. Went, yeah you went to the legendary house in new york yeah. i mean tell me about this experience it brings a smile on my face every time i talk about it it was my postmaster chef it was one of the one of the toughest experiences mm-hmm. Because you're cooking in the James Beard house and, and there's critics everywhere and you have to source all the, all the food. So you have to control your quality and, and your ingredients. Mm-hmm. So I, I had like this meat that was shipped in the day before. I got this cheese and I got that and I got the other. And so I was in charge of getting all of my ingredients, cooking all my ingredients and making sure that it got to the servers, mm-hmm. um, which is a lot. It's a lot to put on yeah. when you're when you're 14, and right. it's always a always one of those ones that I think that really defines what it means to be a chef. That's amazing. Um, so so you're a chef entrepreneur, right? Mm-hmm. So, um, I know you started like an underground supper club. So and you created Logan's Rub, and you've written a cookbook. So, out of the th- all of these things, what are some of the challenges that you faced and how do you manage all of it? All right. Well, my rub really began. I, I started it. I started it before Master Chef, and, mm-hmm. and I really started it to get this cups out, like Pinewood Derby track timer thing. 
Mm. So that, like, I don't know. I was at regionals one year, and uh, I lost. And I was <laughs> like, well, I, I don't think the judging was quite fair. So I was like, all right, well, I'll raise money to buy this track timer so that nobody else can ever get rooked again. There'll, there'll, <laughs> be, the, there'll be a laser, and you can't dispute the laser. Yeah. End of story. <laughs> so that's what I started on. And I started with Fiesta. Mm-hmm. It's just like a southwestern style, and I really enjoy it. And I, and I raised, I raised enough money, and, and I got the timer for the for the pack, mm-hmm. and um, it was fun. And then, you know, I kind of put it on hold. I wrote, I wrote a couple more, so mm-hmm. I had like I had three, three oh. or four, okay. three or four rubs. I, I did like some other seasonings and and stuff. Mm-hmm. And then I went on Master Chef, and then came back from Master Chef. I did a bunch of charity stuff, mm-hmm. and then. There was this YouTuber by the name of Stuart Edge. Mm-hmm. And I, I went out to Salt Lake City to do a video with him. Okay. And this video was centered around cooking Wagyu steaks for fathers on Father's, on father's Day. Okay. And mm-hmm. that's where I created my favorite, my favorite rub, mm-hmm. my steak blend. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's like this thyme blend. It's really amazing. Can't mm-hmm. tell you the ingredients because, I mean, yeah. it's my favorite blend. Very <laughs> close to my heart. Like, I mean, probably give you, I'll probably give you my left hand before, <laughs> before I give it over. But um, that one, that was kind of how Logan's Rub is. And, and I sometimes sell it. I sometimes package it. But I try to make sure that the spice quality is up to snuff. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, whenever you're putting out a product, you want it to be delicious. And you want it to be delicious even for people who aren't you. Mm-hmm. Like okay. I can make yeah, I can make a lot of things tasty mm-hmm. just because I cook it. Just because I can get the cook just right on. I can get it mm-hmm. perfect medium rare, or I can get the perfect amount of seasoning. But I wanted to make it so that it would taste amazing, even to people who are just average at cooking. Just mm-hmm. kind of just threw it on there for fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's kind of one of the things. So you gotta buy the spices, and you gotta package it in a sanitary environment. So. Mm-hmm. I used to do it at this like church kitchen where they served like some, some soup kitchen meals and stuff yeah. like that um, because I needed an industrial space to do it where there mm-hmm. weren't any pets and allergens and mm-hmm. things like that. So uh, I made sure of that. And then, you know, you got to make sure that you don't get your, your labels and that the, the feds don't come knocking down your door because you're selling spices out the back. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so that's kind of the challenges with that. Also, yeah. it's a challenge to find a, like a co-packer to okay. go pack them to sell them on a large scale because I tried to sell I tried to sell them back once I finished Master Chef, but uh, I had such a spike in orders that I realized like I I can't do this like mm-hmm. I can't fulfill this mm-hmm. I, I have no fulfillment if I'm if I'm even for the small run mm-hmm. I'd be like the kitchen for like two weeks just blending yeah. Good point. <laughs> so that's kind of a challenge mm-hmm. and with the supper club. Um, you know, I sometimes do it. Mm-hmm. It's one of those things that I only really do when I really want to, because yeah. you're going into somebody's home and you're going into their kitchen and you're and you're feeding them, and that's a that's a very personal experience. And, yeah. And there's a lot that can go wrong with that, you know. So I try to be very safe with that mm-hmm. that one. I try to make sure, like, I know I know what I'm doing. I know who I'm going to. Mm-hmm. I know what's going to happen. Uh, I know my menu. I have all my ingredients. I have all my tools. Mm-hmm. Because when when you can't, when you don't have all your tools, you don't know. Are they gonna have a frying pan? Maybe not. Are they gonna are they, are they gonna are they gonna have an extra spoon? Who knows? So when you ask yourself those kind of questions, it makes it a lot more challenging. Okay. And um, the book, the book, <laughs> it's fun. It's a project. I, I need a cookbook and. It was just the, the coolest thing I could think of because it's like a graphic novel and then a cookbook. Yeah. Yeah. And it's really fun. I really love it. And um, it won an award. Yeah. Ramon, best first book in, in the world um, back in like, I think, 2019 That's or amazing. 2018. Mm-hmm. And uh, I went to China and for, the, for the award ceremony, which was incredible. Mm-hmm. And to be able to like taste those flavors and to go out there and whenever you go to another country and travel, it's just like nothing else. Just can't describe it. it. I love it. I love it too. Um, 
So how does, you live in Memphis, so how does your, your hometown, how does your community help you? Well, Memphis, how I like to describe Memphis to, to people is it's a small town, but also a big city. But we're also pretty small because you can, you can get relationships really easy. You can talk to people really easy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you can talk to the chefs too, you know. Um, I used to go grocery shopping and there was a local chef who used to shop there too. And I'd shop with them and we'd look <laughs> at like the green beans and be like, I don't, I, don't, I don't think these are fresh, chef. And he'd be like, yeah, I feel you. <laughs> I'm going to have to replace these with something else. And so it's very easy to get some really amazing connections. Like okay. one of my best chef friends, Chef Ben Smith, had Tsunami. Um, I just called him up one day and I said, hey, chef, you know, um, I've heard that you're the best seafood chef in town. And um, uh, I want like a lesson because my mom's allergic and We'll bring in some seafood and just like teach me how to cook it. I'm really passionate about food. And he was like, oh, sure. Yeah. Come on down. And I'll show you a thing or two. They're very and welcoming. Yeah. They're very, very welcoming. So in that sense, it's very much like a, like a small town. But yeah. that's some of the big city amenities. Mm-hmm. So I think like in many ways, I couldn't have done what I've done without Memphis. Okay. So how do you, how do you contribute back to your community? Well, I tried to agree to almost every um, charity or service thing that I can, you know, if, if there's somebody to help, I try and help them. You know, I've done the real man wear pink campaign here in yep. Memphis and I've helped raise a bunch of money for that. Mm-hmm. That was pretty crazy. Cause I had to wear pink every day. <laughs> pink <laughs> shoes come in handy. <laughs> and um, so that, that was pretty cool. And then I also volunteer at the soup kitchens. I take out invasive species at the park um, I just do a lot. Uh, help with like food drives, and the food pantry. I did that one this Christmas or one of these Christmases. And I just try to work a lot of good in the city because, you know, when you get good, you got to give good. Good and point. Yeah. That's how you got to keep that cycle going. So. Yeah, 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 definitely. Um, so you've accomplished so much. I guess what are you most proud of and how do you keep everything in perspective? I think you've covered a lot of the ones I, I really love. Um, I'm really proud of the, the work I did at the Roots Festival, the Fayetteville Roots Festival. Oh. I cooked, um, I think it was, I served like 1,200 samples and then oh. like another 800. I think, I think, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh. Um, and that was a really incredible experience because you have to leave a, lead a team. And those yeah. leadership skills are just invaluable and, and yeah. learning how to use your voice and learning like food costs and structuring and planning it out. Like that, that one was really challenging. And I think really, really pushed me to a new, to new limit. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, you've covered a lot of the other ones I really mm-hmm. love. I really love the TEDx talk. Mm-hmm. I really love the James Beard, MasterChef, Obama. Just all of those are just great experiences. Mm-hmm. Um, and we covered the book and, and going to China, which was amazing. Mm-hmm. And I guess there, there's only one, one more that I really love. And that I was a judge at the Young Chef Olympiad, which oh. is kind of Olympiad of third year culinary students from around the world went to India mm-hmm. and did this cooking competition. And I was one of the judges. And That's great. Yeah. going to India was incredible. And you just mm-hmm. see like things you've never seen before. Like I remember we were driving in, I think it was day two. Yeah, and there's this guy riding an elephant in the median of the highway, just <laughs> going down the street, just going yeah. down the median. Yeah, for you, wearing it, oh, riding an elephant, and you're just like, look at it. You're like, I'm not in the U.S. <laughs> what am I doing? Where am I? Yeah. So how was? Did, I'm sure. Did you taste like um, a lot of the food there? The authentic food. Uh, I tried to, <laughs> you know, sometimes it's very hard because you got, you got to stay safe. I know. So yeah. sometimes I would, I would be like running out to try something and then I look and I see him like cut the raw meat and then the cooked meat with the same knife. And I'd be like, you have to be okay. Careful. But I did have this amazing Kati roll that the students mm-hmm. cooked. That's they, they, they were doing this lunch and they were made like this chicken Kati roll. And it was mm-hmm. just like amazing. And I was like, wow this is great. And they were like, yeah, we make this for lunch. Like every Wednesday yeah. we bring, we bring out the pop music. 
because they had like Taylor Swift on, <laughs> and I was like on this rooftop in India eating this delicious like Indian chicken burrito thing. Yeah, and I was like, "This is great! I love this." That's amazing. So, uh, yeah, experiences like that you just just can't forget. Um. So, how do you manage your finances? Like, do you, do your parents help you? Do you, do you have a financial advisor? Um, it's, it's pretty much me and me and my parents for the mm-hmm. most part, you know, um, food costs is always a tough one. Cause you have to think like, is it worth it? Mm-hmm. And how much is it going to cost? Mm-hmm. And how do I make sure that I make that money back? Yeah. Cause with food, you know, there's, there's a set cost and it's all in the margin levels mm-hmm. in the margin. So, um, like if you make something and, and like, you got to make 150 ramens. And you got to serve pork and a vegetarian option and a, and a stock. Uh, how much is that seasoning worth? Mm-hmm. Like, is it is the mirin worth it? Is this eleven dollars? Is it in the budget? And so I think you got to write that out and then figure out like what you can't afford, what you can't afford. Pretty much, it's just me and you know I save, mm-hmm. I work, I save. Did you did work. you like take an initiative to to learn about money management? Um, I've done, a, I've done a few classes. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think that you always got to be smart and you always have to think like, is, is it worth it? And mm-hmm. like, even if it's something like, uh, I like to, I like to play video games. So mm-hmm. is this game worth it? Am I going to get the $60 out of it? Or, um, there's a sale, so I better buy it now. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, just kind of small things or even if it's full price, like think to yourself, like, man, am I going to get the full price of happiness out of this? I think that one of the things that you always have to think about whenever you're spending money is like how you're spending it, if it's smart, mm-hmm. and do you need it? Like if you're budgeting out, like, out of it. Yeah. Yeah. Like, That's- you know, do you really need the newest phone? Mm-hmm. That's the question. And like when things break, you know, you got to not be afraid to invest in yourself and to invest in what you really want. That's good. And to understand that you need to take care of it. Like, mm-hmm. I bought myself a camera because I, I like to take photos. Yeah. And I'm a pretty big photographer. I okay, love it. Cool. So it goes with the travel, photography, okay. food. All three kind of all go together. Yeah. But, you know, I have to think, like, well, am I going to get enough money out of it? Am I going to love it? Uh, am I going to like the feel? Is it worth it? And, and at the end of the day, I was like, yeah, I want, I want a camera. Mm-hmm. And so I bought it, and I love it, and I kept good care of it. And I think that that's something that when it's your money, this was something my mom taught me very early on. Mm-hmm. If it's your money, you're going to take care of it better. You're going to love it more. Good point. I was going to feel more pride when you pick it up. So mm-hmm. whenever I pick up my camera, I'm always like, wow, I got to be careful. got to put the strap on. Got to make sure I don't drop it. Mm-hmm. I, always, I always feel great when I'm using it because I spend my money on it. Mm-hmm. And when you, buy, when you buy your own things, you're, you take better care of them. And, and mm-hmm. you value them more and you, you make the tougher decision mm-hmm. when it's your money on the line. Like if it's your money and you're going into like an investment on like a class, or you're going into an investment on like a new computer or a new mm-hmm. game, you have to think like, oh, do I really want it that bad? And you have to think about all that, all those hours of hard work that you've gone through to get that money and to, to get this option. Yeah. Is it worth it? Mm-hmm. So, you know. And uh, I think that that really helps me yeah, keep my finances right. in check. Yeah, I see that. Um, so I guess what would your perspective um, be on money overall? Like, It's important. And, mm-hmm. you know, I think that if you're doing something that you don't want to do for money, um, one of the best pieces of advice I have is to always have something in your hand that you bought with your money that you love and you mm-hmm. absolutely love. like. I don't care if it's a coin, a ring, mm-hmm. bracelet, mm-hmm. shirt, phone, watch, doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. As long as you have something in your hand that you love, camera, mm-hmm. and that you've worked hard for, and that you know the toil is in, then it can make it a lot easier to do things, and it can yeah. make you a lot happier. Because you know that at the end of the day, you can get another one, or you mm-hmm. get something else that you love. Mm-hmm. And... I think that that's something that I, I always think about with my money. 
Why do you think financial literacy is important for teens? Um, I think it's very important because right, I'm, I'm going to bring up another personal story here. I have a friend of mine and he loves cars, mm -hmm. but he, he doesn't have a job mm -hmm. and he doesn't, he, he has just his car's mom bought him, um, which is kind of a hand me down. Mm -hmm. And so I think that it matters because he'd be able to realize his dream and to be working for it and to be getting closer and to being like, Oh man, I'm only $2,000 away from that car I want mm -hmm. or something. And like, if he, if he has the financial literacy, mm -hmm. um, he might be able to work out a plan to get what he wants or to be working on what he wants to yeah. really get that satisfaction. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, when you have money and, and I'm going to say this from experience, like mm -hmm. cashing checks and things, when you have the money in your hands, you want to spend it. Mm -hmm. And sometimes Sometimes you spend it, but sometimes you got to save it for later. Yeah. And, you know, there's just no feeling quite like cashing a paycheck mm -hmm. and feeling and feeling the money and feeling all that work. Mm -hmm. And it's just inevitable that you want to spend it right away. Yeah. Like everyone wants to. I've done it. I felt it. I've gone to the store the same day. Yeah. It's not smart for saving money. Yeah. <laughs> but like. there's no feeling like it. So that's, that's what you work for. Yeah, interesting. Um, so what would your advice be to young entrepreneurs and I guess young chefs? Um, you know, for young entrepreneurs, think about think about your product, think about who's gonna buy it, think about how you're gonna get the word out. Mm -hmm. And you know, make sure that when you when you invest in, in it, when you invest in your dream that mm -hmm. uh, it might turn not turn out. And you mm -hmm. have to be mentally prepared for that good point right? you have to be prepared to fail but you have to think that you're going to succeed so it's kind of an oxymoron because you have to be you have to be perfectly fine with failing you have to be perfectly fine saying this didn't work that money's down the drain too bad but you also have to believe deep down that it's going to work and that you're going to succeed that's great yeah and for young chefs you know just Cook with your heart. Cook with passion. If it's not your best, don't serve it. Mm -hmm. Food makes people happy. Always remember that. Oh, always cook to make someone smile. Mm -hmm. Or cook because you have a dream. Cook because you have an idea. Cook because you want a flavor that's out of this world. That's lovely. That's amazing. Um, thank you so much, uh, Logan, for being on my podcast. I'm so honored to have you. Um, I love your journey and all your advice and all your little stories. It's amazing. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. I'm so happy I could share, you know, what I've gone through and, and all my experiences. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. So that's the end of the interview. And I mean, it was super cool to hear everything Logan had to say from his experiences in the kitchen to meeting all these amazing people to going to interesting places, um, his pretty unique perspective on money. Um, also what it's like to be a teen entrepreneur and the support he gets from his community, but also how he gives back to his community. Um, it's just really lovely. Also, I think what really stood out to me was just his pure passion for food and quite literally everything he does, and it's just totally inspiring. If you want to learn more about him and what he's doing right now, um, more about his books, you can visit his website, which will be linked in the show notes. And also, don't forget to read this week's Voices Post by Avalon Lee from Santa Clara, California. Um, she writes this really powerful poem about Black Lives Matter um, and the recent protests. Um, and her writing is just absolutely lovely. And that will be um, on the Wi-Fi Matters website. So definitely go read her fantastic poem. And of course, happy Father's Day. And hope you are all doing something special with your dads and your family. Um, so thank you for listening. And I can't wait to talk to you guys next time. <laughs>